know that we're kind of keeping things moving along here. We want to give you plenty of time, Brother Dame, to do what you feel that the Lord would want you to do. So would you come and uh, just open up your heart and, and talk to us here tonight? God bless you. Let's make them welcome again. Could we do that? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Can we give a hand clap of praise to Jesus Christ, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. Hallelujah. You're Thank worthy, you, Jesus, of the highest praise. There's no God like our God. There's no rock like our rock. He is the great I am. Hallelujah. Wonderful counselor, prince of peace, the mighty God, the everlasting father. Hallelujah. He is worthy of all of our praise this evening. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. It is a privilege and an honor to be here again with you all. And I believe it was 2016, uh, a memor memorable uh, weekend. And my parents were celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary. We got here three hours late after blowing an engine in Connecticut. Amen. But we're thankful, Pastor Channel, for you helping. Amen. With a generous sacrificial offering to help us get the engine back, our new engine. Amen. Get back on the road. We also thank you since 2016. Amen. Your faithful support with Partners in Missions. We thank you for that. And also, uh, last August when I was in the hospital, amen, another sacrificial offering to help us with the medical bills and all of that. Thank you. Amen. And thank you from the bottom of my heart and my family's heart. Amen. For that generous act of love. Amen. It's, glad, it's good to be part of the kingdom of God. The family of God. Amen. And my family, my sister, my older sister, not oldest sister, but one of my older sisters is here. Amen. You know, Sister Margie Strout. Amen. Her children. What a blessing and honor to be back in Maine. Amen. Brother Kennedy. I see him twice in one week. Amen. He moved. Amen. I was over there. But uh, going to Attleboro uh, every New Year's and seeing him and then being a, the district superintendent. Amen. And back in Maine. Amen. A uh, cousin of our family. And so good to see Brother Kennedy, all the family here. Amen. The Medore family that allowed us to live in the trailer for a night last week. Thank you. Amen. For allowing us to stay there. Amen. want to share with you tonight uh, what God is doing in Bolivia. We have a video we'll be showing in a few minutes. And uh, if we can show you in five minutes what God has done in 17 years, we need to be fired. Amen. Someone else needs to go there. But uh, we do have a short video to share some of all that's been going on. And uh, we arrived in 2004. And God opened the door for us to be involved in many ministries, uh, mostly the Bible school ministry, our first six years there. Amen. And we want to thank all of our ladies. How many ladies here have given to ladies' ministry? Amen. Can we give a hand clap of gratitude from all over the world to our ladies? Amen. When I was 19, I went to Argentina on the AIM program for a year. <clears throat> and uh, I did my laundry in the sink at the Bible school with the rest of the Bible school boys. I used a one-by-four piece of wood, a scrub brush. And that's how I did my laundry for a year. Unless the missionary said, come cut our grass or paint the house and bring your laundry. I did my laundry at the sink. But thanks to our ladies, we get a washer, dry, and refrigerator. Yeah. Amen. And we don't have to do our laundry that way. And about two years ago, my wife went home and our, she smelt burning wires, electric, plastic burning. And uh, she was able to save our laundry, but not the dryer. It gave up the ghost after 16 years. And uh, we were able to tell headquarters, uh, we need a new dryer. And immediately, the ladies' ministry sent an offering to help cover a new dryer. So we say thank you to all of our ladies that give sacrificially towards that. But, but more important, the ladies' ministry also provides Bible school scholarships. Excuse me, Ed. We're able to help the students go to Bible school with the scholarships. Because if you made $2 a day wages, you don't have $200 to go to Bible school. And my wife and daughter will be coming in a few seconds to tell you how many dialects are spoken in Bolivia. It's not just Spanish. Uh, we have many dialects, and if I'm a slow learner. It's taken me almost 30 years to preach in Spanish, half decent. And uh, I would not want to learn all of the dialects that are spoken there. So uh, we're able to train 
people that speak the dialects and send them out to start churches. I mean, I'm thankful. My first six years, I, my first day was ask each student, how much can you pay of your school bill? Almost all of them said none of it. Uh, but I was able to tell them, don't worry about the money. Get good grades. Leave school and go start a church. So uh, we're thankful for our ladies' ministry. How many young people have washed a car or given money? Uh, or how many people have paid to wash the car? Maybe you went home and rewashed it. It's not done by experts, but uh, thank you. Amen. But we're thankful. Can we give a hand clap to all of our young people that work with Move the Mission? Amen. Move the Mission buys a vehicle for all of our missionaries. And we're able to take 22 children to Sunday school in a seven-passenger Nissan Pathfinder. Uh, if you don't believe me, look on the back picture there. You'll see some in the video as well. Uh, we're able to go and, and do many things because we have a vehicle. Amen. And uh, since 2005, uh, up till now, we've been working primarily in the prison ministry. Uh, in Bolivia, when you go to prison, you have to buy or rent your own jail cell. You have to provide your own meals. Uh, you have to provide soap, shampoo, everything. The only thing the government gives you is four walls, bars, and policemen on the outside to make sure no one comes out and they get paid for anything that goes in. Uh, a couple months ago, they did a search in three of the high security prisons. They found a live grenade in each one. Uh, so things do get in that aren't supposed to be there. Uh, as well as children. Uh, they bring their children in the men's prison. They were bringing their wives and children there. Thankfully, they have stopped that. But uh, there are about 4,000 children that live in prison with their mothers. And we're able to take 20 to 30 of them every Sunday uh, to Sunday school with our Move the Mission vehicle. And uh, at this moment, I'm going to have my wife and daughter come. Uh, my wife is from Guatemala. Uh, we met when I was on the AIM program working in campus ministry. And uh, she was also working in campus ministry, actually taught me all I know about campus ministry. So uh, almost 23 years later, we're still working together. And our daughter, Pamela Jasmine, is from Cochabamba, Bolivia. Good evening. Many blessings. Dios les bendiga. We're very happy to be here and to be visiting my sister-in-law's church. And um, there's 36 dialects in Bolivia, and there's two main ones, that is Quechua and Aymara. And today, Pamela, she's going to teach you one word in Quechua and one in Aymara. And as you know, in Spanish, Dios le bendiga is God bless you, and she's going to teach you that word in Quechua and Aymara. Hola, yo soy Juanito, y yo soy Juanita. Hoy día les vamos a enseñar una, unos idiomas que es Aymara y Quechua. En Quechua sería... Dios bendice sucho y en Aymara sería Dios ampique. Espero que les haya gustado las guaguitas, ¿eh? And as she said, in Quechua, it's Dios bendice sucho, God bless you. And in Aymara, it's Dios ampique. And we always say if someone tells us the, those two words in our table, we're going to give them a coin from Bolivia. <laughs> and um, we uh, work mainly in the prison ministry and on Sundays, we pick up, a, as my husband was saying, a 20 to 30 kids that live in the prison. There used to be even teenagers there, and now they just let the ones from five and under live there. The rest go to their, their family members or go to orphanages. And we take them to Sunday school, feed them lunch on Sundays, um, and uh, we take them to the park or we do sports with them and then we take them back. But during the week, we, we are actively helping them. Some of them need to go to the doctor, or some of them, if they have surgery and there's no one to go with them to the hospital, we do that. And even go with them to their graduation, because they sometimes don't have anyone to go with them. And sometimes we, we are concerned about our world, and that's good, because we are concerned about our family, our neighbors, our city, and our country. But today I ask you to expand your vision and to please go with us as a prayer missionary because there's three ways that you can be a missionary by going, by giving, or by praying. 
And today I want you to please pray for South America and in the heart of South America, there's Bolivia. If you could go and pray for us and also for the access challenge countries. We, we also say, we always say, if you could please pray for those countries, we have information in our table because there's countries in which the Bible cannot be given to people. They cannot go to the prisons as we do and they can't preach the word. Thank God we can't do that now. But right now, they haven't been able to have services. It's the third wave of COVID in Bolivia. And uh, we had many people from our churches, even pastors, died and passed away in these two months. months. And um, because there's no oxygen, no medicine, or no place in the hospital. It's getting lower. And thank you, because of your support, we were able to help many of them. But uh, right now, we need your prayers for that so that they can have uh, go to the church and have church. They are doing it online. And um, we need to reach more people. We need to be in the streets preaching. And we only can do that if we have the liberty and there's no uh, pandemic there. So please pray for them with that. And be a prayer missionary with us. Please go with us as a prayer missionary and pray for us. Thank you for your support and for your love for missions. God bless you. Amen. We're going to take you to Bolivia. We're going to take you to the church we started in 2012. And we're very thankful that uh, we were able to break the 100 barrier before we left our last Sunday of this year, in April, uh, we had 107, uh, and uh, we're thankful for that. God has, has given us an, an increase. After returning in 2016, there was 30 people less uh, than when we left there to come back, so we started almost over. And uh, then with the pandemic and quarantine, on, and we started back up in October and then had a shutdown in, in uh, February. Uh, so we lost another 20 people, but when we opened the doors again, there was 107 people in church on that Sunday. Amen. We're excited that God is changing lives, and we're going to show you that. We're going to actually start out flying over the Christ of the Concordia that overlooks the city of Cochabamba, a city of one million people, the land of the eternal spring. And uh, we, have almost a mil we have a million people in the city, almost two million in the state. Uh, so we're going to fly over that and then fly down uh, via drone uh, to the church and then go into a service that's already started. We're about 10 minutes late, but in Bolivia, you can be 10 minutes late and still on time. So let's go to church in Cochabamba City.
Amen. We use horse therapy, extreme sports, radio ministry, and then prison ministry, campus ministry, and then involved in all of it, and then so that no one dies without a chance. Amen. No one should die without being able to reject or obey the gospel. I mean, if someone dies and goes to hell, let it be because they rejected the gospel and not because they never heard it. Amen. When I left the deputation in 2010, I, uh, before we arrived back in Bolivia, I wrote down some goals. One of those was to have a secular radio program. I mean, God opened the doors for us. I did not want to preach on a Christian station. They kick us off as soon as they hear our doctrine anyways. And uh, I wanted to preach to sinners. I don't want to preach to people that go to other churches. Amen. So we prayed and God opened the door for us uh, to have this radio ministry now for six years. Amen. We'll be starting a, a dot of work as a result of this. People in an area of town, we don't have a church. Amen. One of the ladies being baptized uh, is from there. Uh, her mother was in my wife's uh, jail ministry uh, service on Thursday. Every Thursday she goes to the ladies' prison. Uh, after her mother got out of prison, her mother wanted her daughter to come. She's in her late 30s. Uh, she was demon-possessed, uh, drug addict, alcoholic. Uh, she, as Due to three abortions that she had as a young person, her life was messed up with drugs and alcohol, trying to numb the pain. Uh, and her mother got her to come to church. Uh, she took her to a church nearby. They prayed her through to the Holy Ghost. She was delivered from demons, but she wanted, uh, she wanted to get baptized at our church. So uh, we baptized her on March 28th of this year. Three, three people from the prison ministry uh, were baptized. But the young lady uh, testifies that um, from the time that she was delivered from demon possession until she was baptized, every night she was tormented by demons. Uh, they would come and torment her. They could no longer possess her, and they were angry. Uh, but they did come to torment her sleep. Uh, she testified on March 28th after she was baptized. She walked about 10 feet to the ladies' room, changed, and the demons appeared to her again. They were angry, uh, and they began to yell at her and say, What did you just do? Why did you do that? We can no longer torment you, and they have not ever done it again. Amen. Amen. Because he that is set free is free indeed. Amen. Uh, and the young man that was baptized in the last picture, he was the enforcer. Uh, he was the insurance collector at the maximum security prison. They would collect up to $5,000 uh, a head. Uh, you either paid your insurance or you fell down the stairs in the middle of the night. And uh, he was the collector of that insurance. But I'm thankful he's on our side. Amen. A very dangerous man, one of the ten most dangerous men in the prison system of Bolivia. Uh, but he is now... Free from drugs, he told me, Pastor, name me a drug, and I was addicted to it. I mean, he could be a chemist uh, with all the drugs that he's manufactured and fabricated in the prison with the, the small amount of resources they have there. But aren't you thankful? God changed his lives. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. And uh, many times I get angry when I go into the prison, the policemen that are frisking me and checking everything, making sure I, don't, I have to make sure I pay for whatever I'm bringing in. Uh, and, and they haven't had to charge me yet, um, thank God. But uh, they always tell me, Pastor, you're wasting your time. They'll never change. You're wasting your time. But I'm thankful I've seen many of them change. Yeah. Close to 300 men have been baptized in Jesus' name. Many filled with the Holy Ghost. Close to 100 ladies baptized. Amen, because the gospel works. I tell them I wouldn't be doing this if it didn't work. I'd be, I don't waste my time teaching or preaching something that doesn't work. It works. Amen, it will change anybody and everybody. Amen, and uh, my wife mentioned you can go by giving, and you're doing that. Amen, if all of our partners increase by $10, we could leave tonight for Bolivia. Amen, we believe that we're going to be a little bit, uh, a short deputation, and we thank God for that. Uh, we are uh, needing to go back. Every time I see the video, I just uh, say, Lord, I want to be there. I want to go back. I mean, there's stuff to do. There's people dying. Amen. And we want them to hear the gospel. Amen. Uh, we left Bolivia on April 15th. And on April 13th, I was with a young man that uh, was released from prison about a year ago. And uh, started coming to our church. In 2009, 
Uh, he walked out of a service. He was the uh, delegate, or the, he was in charge of the church. He'd been baptized by another pastor, uh, not uh, in Jesus' name. Uh, but he was there for nine years helping the church. The prisoners elect their leaders. Other prisoners that are, are in charge of the prison, they literally run uh, the prison. And uh, they elect the people that are going to run it. And uh, they elect the guys that are going to run the church. And everything I do, I have to get their permission. I have to write a letter to the prison officials of Cochabamba State and also to the leaders of the church. And if one of them denies me, uh, then I can't do what I want to do. And this young man uh, always helped us. But one day uh, we had a service where four men just started speaking in tongues, getting the Holy Ghost one by one. And he and another guy walked out. They were angry. Uh, they didn't believe in speaking in tongues. And uh, they left the service. They were upset. And uh, thankfully, they didn't uh, try to stop me from keep going. Uh, but long story short, in March, we had our ninth uh, church anniversary, celebrating nine years. And uh, this young man was there, and he received the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues <laughs> like he didn't agree with. <laughs> Amen. Because if you believe, you can receive. You will receive. Amen. And uh, so I really wanted him to get baptized in Jesus' name before we left because uh, we had no one to leave the prison ministry with. Not everyone wants to do it. And uh, I knew that if he got baptized, he could be a candidate to be used very quickly in, in leadership and ministry. And um, I wasn't sure how to approach him. Just prayed and asked God to open the door. And uh, our last night, our second to the last night there, uh, we were getting ready to say goodbye. We'd worked all day together on a project and uh, instead of uh, taking him home, I was going to pay a taxi and t tell him goodbye and, and let him take a taxi home. But I knew it was my last chance to talk to him. I'd have 30 minutes. Uh, and the only thing he was going to do was jump out and, and, and run away from me. So what did I have to lose? Uh, so I began to talk to him about how he's baptized and how we baptize. And if he know, knew there was a difference. And, and he, he cut me off and he said, Pastor, I was going to ask you if I could get baptized because uh, I want to get baptized in Jesus' name. But I didn't know if I should wait till you came back. And I almost drove off the road and hit somebody. The man is so excited. Uh, but we baptize him the next day. If I have to leave the Bolivia, I mean, I want to do it baptizing somebody in Jesus' name. Amen. And uh, my wife mentioned you can go as, as with your prayers. You can go physically. We'd love to have your visit. Amen. Talk to your pastor. Amen. My brothers, go down. If you can't handle going down with him, come down by yourself. And uh, we always have fun. Uh, but you can go. Physically, you can go by giving or you can go by praying. We have many ways that you can go by giving. You have the yellow slip. You, you're faithfully supporting, and we thank you for that. Uh, but we also have some projects uh, going on in the back table. My wife and daughter will uh, share with you things that we're selling so that we can raise money for the projects. One of those things is uh, twice a month, my wife brings 60 rolls of yarn to the prison and gives them to the ladies in her Bible study, and they knit something, and then we buy it. And uh, now we're selling it so that we can buy more yarn when we go back. So the purchase of anything on the table uh, with, that has been knitted was knitted by a lady in prison. And we paid them for that so that they could feed their children. Uh, but now when we go back, we want to be able to feed more people that way. They're working, uh, not just receiving money, but they're working for it. And that is a little more healthy. Uh, also, we're raising money. Uh, many of you know the, the Harvey Howe Memorial Church where we planted in 2012. And uh, we build that as a memorial uh, to remember, amen, a man and, and his wife and his children, amen, I counted up one day, there's about 34 ministers of the gospel with the blood flowing from the veins of my grandparents. We want to honor them. Uh, there's an old proverb, a German proverb that says, tradition does not mean to worship the ashes of an old fire. Tradition means to transfer the fire. Another version of that says to preserve the fire. But I want to focus on transferring fire to the next generation. I don't want them to live on a deja vu or a testimony that somebody's grandfather told them 30, 40 years ago. I mean, everyone needs to get near the fire and have an experience for themselves because a, the a, a theory can be trumped by an experience. And the Jehovah's Witness knocked on my door and I uh, wanted to proved to me that speaking in tongues was of the devil and it didn't happen anyways it's not for us today and all this and I, I just told them well what do you do with a man that you heard speaking in Spanish and know every and know and understand everything he said and that's not of the devil 
Amen. That is someone that said, thank you, Jesus, for your blood that flowed from Calvary and washed away my sins. Amen. I heard a, a man worshiping God in Spanish in Louisiana, and when I went to him after church to talk to him in Spanish, he could not understand me. So an experience will trump a theory. Amen. When you know that you know that you know that you've felt and seen the fire, amen, no one can convince you otherwise. Amen. And so uh, you can help us by buying a square foot. Uh, my brother Ryan is uh, making some pens. Uh, we're selling those for $50. The purchase of that is actually $50 a square foot of land. Uh, you're, get, you're basically getting the pen for free because what we're doing is buying a square foot with the $50. So if you can help us by buying a square foot of land in Bolivia, uh, we can send you the link. You can click on and look on the satellite and see uh, that you own a foot, a square foot on 1824 Eduardo Caba Street, Cochabamba City. And if you want to help us, talk to your pastor. Amen. And he'll uh, direct you to how to do that. Amen. And so uh, there's ways that you can go by giving. And uh, we want to um, redeem the time tonight by sharing with you from the book of Acts, chapter 14. Amen. I was in a four and a half hour debate with a Jehovah's Witness one Monday in Louisiana. Uh, and he came back the next Monday for another one. Uh, but in the middle of the second, ter uh, I don't know, uh, debate, whatever, uh, people say you shouldn't debate, but Paul disputed. Uh, so I think debating is a little less uh, harsh than disputing. Uh, I don't dispute or debate, I just share scripture. Uh, but he looked at me and he said, can you talk about anything that's not from Acts? I said, well, okay. I'll go to Acts 238's twin brother, 1 Corinthians 6.11, and... Same thing. Amen. But Acts 14, uh, verse 8 and through 10. Amen. When I was 12 years old, I memorized the first uh, 14 chapters of Acts. And on the way up here, remembering going to Dice Arts after Bible quizzing, getting, getting, um, getting wiped out of the tournament by the church from Dexter. Amen. And those people knew how to memorize scripture. But I'm thankful. I mean, I had a mom and dad that sacrificed so we could be at every camp meeting. I mean, instead of an Xbox or PlayStation, it was camp and Bible quizzing. I don't know how they did it with seven kids, but I'm very thankful and grateful for that. Amen. Acts chapter 14, verse 8. And there sat a certain man at Lystra, impotent in his feet, being crippled from his mother's womb, who never had walked. Look at your neighbor and said, never had walked. The same heard Paul speak was steadfastly beholding him and perceiving that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, Stand upright on thy feet, and he leaped and walked. And I want to share with you for a few minutes on the title, Never is Not a Precedent. Amen. Never is Not a Precedent. My last year of high school, I had a lot of time to fill. I didn't have a car, so I couldn't take early release. And so I filled my uh, schedule with some easy courses, and one of those was a class on law. And uh, that year we watched the videos of O.J. Simpson's trial, so we didn't really do much. Um, but a couple of the terms that we learned was the precedent and beyond all reasonable doubt. And there, there are cases where the lawyers or the defending or whoever's trying to win the case will realize that there's no precedent to base their arguments on. So uh, they dig and dig and dig. And then finally sometimes they'll look in the find uh, in history where there was a case decided in the way they want it to. So they'll present that as precedent. This is a case that proves to us the decision was a correct decision or a just or a fair decision. But in the supernatural there, is, there isn't a case to where we can go back and say here's a precedent of that happening. Uh, there are people today, and, and I know that we need to be very careful, amen, uh, when, when we don't have precedent, uh, we cannot base a doctrine or new doctrine on, uh, on just whatever we're feeling. If, if you wanted to, you could say, um, John uh, ate locusts and honey and dressed in camel hair. You could start your own religion by that diet and that, that dress, and you'd be in the book. But I believe there has to be precedent when we're talking doctrine. If there isn't, then we have to be very careful. 
But in the supernatural, many times there's not precedent. Because Jesus healed, I believe there's six cases. Bible quizzing helped me to look for patterns and, and repetition. And there's about six times that Jesus received a blind person and was asked to heal them. The second time he was presented a blind person, they told him to do what he did the first time. Put your hand on him and he will be healed. But Jesus didn't say, you're right, that's 101, how to heal a blind person. And repeat it. No, Jesus had a million different ways to do the same thing. So Jesus is presented the second blind person. And they told him, put your hand on him and he'll be healed. But Jesus violated social distancing, protocol of, of doctor-patient relation. He, re he violated all the, the policy and procedure of hygiene. And he spit in the man's face. But what he was saying was, I am not predictable. I do things my way. How I want to, when I want to, where I want to. And the fact that God is not predictable obligates us to pray. I believe that's one of the reasons. Many reasons. Because if we just keep repeating what he did, okay, this is the magical thing. Suck both your index fingers, stick them in the guy's ear and tell him to be open and he's healed. Another way Jesus violated the taboos. Right? But the fact that he's not predictable obligates me to put my nose on the floor and say, I don't know what to do. I need you to help me. My mom told me this morning at breakfast the story of my grandfather. There was... Division in the church because the Branhamites came in and so in there. Not, it's not even scientific and not even close to the Bible. And my grandfather was going to go and talk to the family that was being dragged out of church into this false doctrine. And he told my grandmother to be ready after she got the kids to school and they were going to go visit this family. And then he came downstairs. He wasn't dressed to go do a house visit. He wasn't in his suit and tie. He said the Holy Ghost spoke to him. He opened his Bible. The first words he, that, that, that uh, he read were, leave her alone. He left her alone. A few weeks later, they came back to church and apologized for even accepting the false doctrine. My grandfather told my grandmother, if I had gone, I would have destroyed that family with, uh, with what I was going to say that day. There's something about the Holy Spirit guiding and directing us. So we don't always have precedent for it. A shadow touching a sick person. We don't have precedent for sending a handkerchief. And it wasn't so Paul could go play golf that day. It wasn't because he, was, he didn't have time to go. I mean, the Holy Ghost just directed. I will facilitate and accelerate. Because I got stuff for you to do. So the fact that this man had never walked doesn't matter. Because in the supernatural, just because it hasn't ever happened doesn't mean it can't. Just because it's never been done that way doesn't mean it can't be done that way. Just because it's, it's something that's never been done doesn't mean it won't produce a miracle. But what I noticed here was the man showed Paul that he had enough faith. Again, repetition and patterns are prominent in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. No one was ever healed without making a scandal or a scene. Man, one of my favorite preachers, Brother Huntley, and I got to sneak in Friday. I tried to sneak in Friday to hear him. The audacity. Jesus loves the audacity that someone says, I'm violating taboo. I'm supposed to be away from people. I can't even be in my own house with my husband and children if she had any. And she's not supposed to touch anybody. But as she crawled on her hands and feet that day, bumping into people and making it so that they would have to go spend six or seven days in, their, in a ceremony to wash their impurities, 
she violated protocol and touched the hem of a garment. Because never is not a precedent. The fact that no one could ever touch Jesus having an issue of blood, not just Jesus, but any person, it didn't matter. Because before someone could say, you're unclean, Jesus could say, show me the unclean. Show me why I'm unclean. Well, that lady has an issue of blood. Where? It's gone. Because Jesus was not affected by an unclean person touching him. Just like the lepers. When Jesus touched the leper, the man said, if you want to, you can make me clean. Jesus didn't say, well, I'm going to go on a 40-day fast in two weeks. Come back after that 40-day fast and I can pray for you and something might happen. Jesus said, I want to be clean. And he was clean. He touched him. He touched the leper. He violated protocol. He violated the law of Moses. But before someone could say, you just touched a leper, Jesus could say, show me the leper. Because never is not a precedent. And there are people who the doctor said, we'll give them a few weeks. But we prayed for them. And 20 year, 21 years later, the cancer hasn't come back. There are people that we have prayed for and have seen God do a miracle in their lives. When you're in the back of an ambulance with someone whose sugar is 600. And they're in a diabetic coma for three days. That just doesn't happen. But the prayer of a righteous man availeth. The effectual fervent prayer of the righteous man availeth much. So tonight, maybe there's a situation. Maybe it's not a physical situation. But maybe your boss told you this week, COVID is a great excuse. Going into hotels, we don't have waffles anymore. We just have an apple and a box of cereal because of COVID. COVID has changed our world. But if your boss tells you, we're going to have to close the doors, then don't hang your head yet. Don't hang your head yet because I serve a God who specializes in the impossible. He is not just a general doctor. He specializes in the impossible. He can heal diseases doctors don't even know about. Never forget the testimony of a man, a pastor, evangelist. Couldn't even read and write. Lady come up for prayer. She said, I've been going to, I've had this problem for years. The doctors don't know what it is. The evangelist that didn't know how to read and write told her, tell your doctor this name. And she went to the doctor the next day, told him the name of her sickness that she had the day before God healed her. Because not only did God reveal to the evangelist the sickness, but he healed her of it. And the doctor realized that she had all the symptoms. He opened the book and said, how did you get this word? A preacher of the gospel. Doctor wanted to meet him. How did he know this? The gift of knowledge, wisdom, and discernment is still working today. So, no matter what you're going through right now, no matter what you're facing, have you heard a word that says he knows the hairs of your head? He has them all counted. Well, I believe in principle. I'm not changing. I'm not adding to. I'm using principle in the word. If he has the hairs of our head counted, do you think he knows how many tears run down your cheek day and night? Do you think he doesn't know how many bills are in your mailbox? And what your bank account looks like right now? So even though you may have never seen a miracle, or you've never seen something done a certain way, it doesn't mean it can't happen. Before you get home tonight, it can be taken care of. You can see the impossible 
changed before you can even turn the key that goes into your house. I had a pastor call me, a pastor in Cochabamba. And I used to be the district superintendent there. Lord have mercy, they had a 31-year-old district superintendent. I don't know what God was doing when he did that. But pastor calls me and said, my 22-year-old daughter ran away from home. I need to resign. He said, I'm a failure. How can I preach to my people when they know my daughter ran away from God and home? I said, do you believe God can have her come back? Yes. Then start praying for her. Oh, I am. Well, if you're going to pray for rain, I want to see your umbrella. Don't ask me to pray for rain if you're not carrying your umbrella. I told him every night, every morning and every afternoon, every time you eat at your table, set a plate at your daughter's table. Put clean sheets on her bed every week. Don't. Don't waste my time asking me to pray for her if you're not going to do this. Within two weeks, he called me back and said, Pastor, my daughter came home tonight. Because prayer changes anything and everything. Our problem is, is we don't always understand the answers. My wife and daughter teach in Sunday school the four answers God gives us. There's a lot of atheists right now. I worked with an atheist in Indianapolis going to Bible school. When he was 10 years old, he prayed for his mom that was dying of cancer. His mom died. He said, I don't believe in God anymore. But there's four answers to prayer. And I was praying. We left in 2010 knowing that our pastor and his wife would probably pass away before we came back. And unfortunately, they did. But when we heard the news that Sister James was very sick and close to death, we are praying, God heal her. And then I saw one day her daughter put on the Facebook that her mother was praying that God would take her. Aren't you glad you're not God? I'm praying, God, save her, heal her, keep her. And she's praying, God, take me. She wanted to go see her two-year-old baby that died. Tragic accident when her husband evangelized and they backed the car up and the daughter come running out to get in the car and daddy didn't see her and backed over her. How do you evangelize and preach when... After that happens, godly people. She was praying, God, I want to go hug my baby in heaven. And I'm selfishly praying, God, I want to see her one more time. So how does God answer people's prayers that are polar opposites? But God, his answers are yes, and we all want yes. But sometimes it's no. And we think silence is God's ignoring us, so we keep praying. But God said no. So people go and they, they say God doesn't exist. And God, I'm an atheist. God doesn't exist because he didn't answer my prayer. I, I asked for this. but We don't understand. God just said no. Is God bad because he said no? How many parents have ever said no to your kid? Dad, I want to I play with your 9 millimeter that's loaded. Four years old. Dad, I, I want to play with your gun. I wanna, Dad, give me the keys to the car. You say no. Are you a bad parent? No, you're a good parent. So we have yes, no, and wait. You're not ready to play with a 9 millimeter yet. You're not ready for the car keys yet. So wait. But how many believe that there's a fourth answer that's better than yes? God says yes, no, wait. I got something better than what you're asking for. I'm going to blow your mind with what I'm going to give to you. So it's not our job to tell Jesus how to fix the stuff. Because he's not predictable. He's got a million different ways to do the same thing. He can fix your problem right now a million different ways. You say, Pastor, that's impossible. I need to win the lottery. I need this. I need that. No. No. You're stuck in a box, and you put God in the box with you. As you stand to your feet right now, I mean, I don't know, but there's someone here that just needs to understand. God's not ignoring you. He may have said no, but that's not the end of the world. 
Because he didn't put his hand on the, on the blind man's left shoulder and said, be healed. He spit in the man's face. Then he made mud balls and put them in his eyes and told him to go wash in the pool. You won't always understand. Because logic is the enemy of faith. Logic and reason are the enemies of faith. It's the enemy of the supernatural. Because if you can explain how it happened, then you eliminate God out of the equation. So don't try to reason it. Just trust Him to give you the answer. Just because it hasn't happened yet doesn't mean it won't. Just because it's not happening the way you think it should happen. We could go on about Naaman. Bless God, he was supposed to get out and, and honor me with being the greatest colonel and the greatest army, the general and the greatest army. And sit down and drink hot tea with me and say, You're, you, deserve, you deserve to be healed. I'm going to. I'm going to call down an angel from heaven and have him heal you. No, go dunk seven times in the dirtiest river. Why? Because you don't, get, you don't in, contaminate the clean waters with leprosy. You can ten, contaminate the dirty waters. Reason and logic would have caused Naaman to go back home without a miracle. But thankfully, there was a young lady that said, why don't you just do what the prophet said? He's closer to God than you'll ever be. Just listen to what he says. He'll never give you the wrong information. He'll never give you information that will make you worse. And if you just obey him, God will do the rest. Because never is not a precedent in the supernatural. Is there somebody here right now that you need an answer from Jesus? You need God to provide. You need God to do it to give you an answer. Don't, don't, get, don't get hung up on how he's going to do it. Just say, Jesus, I accept how you're going to do it. I accept the answer if it's no, because that means you've got a better way of doing it. And you've got to understand, if, if the answer to your prayer is determined by the self-will of who you're praying for, It's gonna, it might take a while. But if you pray Philippians 2.13, God give them the will to. God give them the want to, to come back home. God, make that prodigal son or daughter hungry enough to remember where the food is. Give them the want to to come back. Give them the will to do your will. Jesus, I ask you right now. Your word is not bound by anything but unbelief. Nothing can stop your word from coming to pass except for our unbelief. I'm asking you, Jesus, to extend your hand down to those that might be hurting. They might be sick. They might be needing a miracle right now. You are the miracle worker, the way maker, the provider. You are Jehovah Jireh. There's nothing you can't fix. There's nothing you can't provide. I'm asking you, Jesus, you specialize in the impossible. What we think is impossible is the easiest thing for you to fix. You can create a world out of nothing. So you can fix our problem very easily. So Jesus, I thank you for my problems. I thank you for the blessed crisis that came into my life because my crisis is an excuse for your glory to be revealed. My sickness is an excuse for your glory and power to be manifested in my life. I trust you, Jesus. I trust you. In Jesus' name. As your pastor comes... I mean, if you have a need in your body, I mean, you can receive it right now, right here, yeah. in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Praise His name. Let's gather into this altar for a few minutes here tonight. Nothing Please come. Let's reach out to the Lord. Impossible. God, have your way. Out to the Lord. Uh,
touch the hem of his garment tonight. God, break every chain. God, do a work upon us tonight. You hold my word God, confirm your word tonight on your people. That healing, that healing to come. Draw by your spirit upon the prodigal. In the name of Jesus. Day you hold have mercy on 